Okay, hello everybody. Please get seated. So, our first talk, our first regular talk of the official DevConf schedule will be by Keith Packer from Hewlett Packard Enterprise and, and Debian Project. And he'll be talking about delivering software for memory driven computing. Please give an applause. Good morning, everybody. I've been here in Montreal for about six hours. Um, to answer the most pressing question that everybody's been asking me, where is BDL? <laughs> BDL just got off of a boat in Vancouver, Canada, and is heading for the airport. So I'll let you know how his flight goes through the day, and uh, we should see him here tomorrow. Um, yeah, and that's, I know that that was the We're most- here for your talk. Yes, I understood. Thank you. I appreciate that. I do appreciate that. But the only question I have been asked so far today, figured I should probably answer that one first. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, how we're delivering soft, how we're using Debian to deliver software for memory-driven computing. <clears throat> and I want to first give a, a, a you know, the the, the thirty-thousand-foot view of what we think memory-driven computing is. Um, I'll show a little uh, demo, uh, a little video from a demo that we did. It's really boring. It's literally a video of a computer monitor. So I apologize for that. But, it, it, you know, it's memory-driven computing. It's a giant box. It's got a bunch of LEDs on the front. They blink a little bit, and that's all you get to see. I mean, my life, my life in computer graphics, 30 years in computer graphics, it was really easy to do demos. And now I'm doing memory-driven computing, and it's like, what do you do for a demo? Well, you have a web page. Okay. Um, so memory-driven computing. What is memory-driven computing? It's uh, our, our uh, vision of the future of computing. Um, um, and why are we doing this stuff, right? Well, the basic motivation is this gap that we've seen. Um, and I'm sorry for the corporate slides, but this really does uh, kind of give an introduction of why we're doing this. Um, why we think it's important, and, uh, and then, then I'll show you what we're actually doing. So we're seeing a gap between the amount of data that's being generated and the processing speed of computing, right? This is a basic, basic gap. Uh, Moore's law has ended. Uh, computers aren't getting any faster. We haven't seen significant imp improvements in processor speed for, what, 10 years now? Uh, it's been amazing. Um, and meanwhile, um, all of us seem to be uploading cat videos at an even ever faster rate. Um, the amount of data that we're capturing continues to increase. Network bandwidths continue to go up. I mean, we're shipping you know, 100 gigabit networking now. Um, who, who would have thought? Um, I lived through the, the early years of Ethernet, and we went from 3 megabits to 10 megabits in like 12 years. Um, and now networking is getting faster at a regular, at a, a fairly good clip. Um, but our computers, are, our ability to compute is not keeping. Um, and the basic problem is uh, one of computer architecture, right? We've had essentially the same computer architecture for 60 years. You, you have a processor, and there's some memory, and the only, only way that you can talk to that memory is from that processor. Um, you're, you have this offline data storage, you have these networks you can communicate uh, in other fashions, but all your communication is very structured and very much software-driven. There's no hardware assist for the for the communication. If you want to do, if you want to communicate with another computer, you have to put together a little network packet uh, and spit out a network packet on your network interface. Um, we would like to think about uh, large-scale systems as being much more tightly integrated than that. Right? We're trying to get to the point where you can actually put a lot of data in one place and have a lot of computers, uh, a lot of uh, apply arbitrary amounts of computing power to it. Uh, so what we're trying to move, we're trying to move from this notion where um, the memory is kind of a, a peripheral of the processor. Well, the memory is where all your data lives. We're trying to take the memory out of this peripheral notion and put it into the center of the computer. Uh, so right now we have kind of two notions of computing. We have scale-up computing, where you get a bigger and bigger and bigger processor and more and more and more memory. Uh, well, Moore's Law kind of says that's kind of over. We're not able to do a lot of that. Um, or you have, um, you have this distributed mo uh, mode where you, where you take the notions we built in the, in the 90s, male wolf clusters and that kind of thing, and you just make a bigger and bigger and bigger cluster. Well, the problem with a bigger and bigger and bigger cluster is now all of a sudden your data is getting sharded into tinier and tinier little fragments. 
And so every processor can only see a tiny amount of the, uh, of the problem. So you have to work very hard to get your problem to the point where you can actually do useful work on, you know, a thousandth of one percent of your data or, or less. As your, as your data sets get larger, the only way you're able to satisfy that is by breaking them into smaller, smaller pieces. Uh, so sharing everything, very difficult uh, from, a, from a hardware perspective. We're trying to do that. Uh, HPE has a couple of products. We have the Superdome X platform, which goes up to 24 terabytes. Uh, 24 terabytes. Uh, and then we have the um, units are hard in my world. I apologize if I, if I misspeak them. And then we have uh, uh, well, recently acquired SGI and their uh, MC990X hardware is brought into the HPE product line. And that one goes even further than that, up to you know, uh, 60 or 100 terabytes of memory. So we're starting to get pretty big scale up systems, but those are really reaching the ends of viability. Um, and so shared everything is not very viable either. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to get something in the middle, something where we have uh, something, something where we have the characteristics of scale up computing in terms of every processor being able to touch all the memory, um, and something of the characteristics of scale out computing where you can add arbitrary amounts of computation um, and have it able to uh, integrate into the systems uh, smoothly. So we're trying to kind of find something in the middle, find new computer architecture someplace in between these two extremes. So that's what memory-driven computing is. We're putting memory in the center of the computer and then we're being able to attach computing to it. Um, and so we're building, we obviously built something called uh, the memory fabric test bed in our machine research, pr research uh, program. Um, and that's kind of an example of that. Um, and I'm gonna show you uh, what that looks like. I have uh, cool pictures. Uh, you can see this is, this is actually in uh, Fort Collins in the office that all of my coworkers work in. Um, you can see that the, uh, the rack, uh, it's a very deep rack. Um, and, the, and the hardware that we built in, it doesn't fit in this very deep rack. It sticks out the front and it sticks out the back. Um, so it's kind of maximally sized for that. It, the original plan was to actually fill an entire rack, um, but we had power and cooling issues. Um, and, <clears throat> and we had actually another interesting issue. It's very difficult to find, uh, to take this new computing architecture and immediately find problems to, uh, to attack it with it. Right, so uh, we spent you know, 50 or 60 years uh, sharding our programs into the scale-out computing. All the supercomputers in the planet are scale-out computers. All the problems in the world are designed for these scale-out systems. And so it's actually difficult to find problems, big problems that need this kind of hardware today. And that's what we're actually spending this year doing, is actually going out and finding some new interesting big problems. Um, we have, uh, we, we, but we do have hardware working. Uh, and it is pretty cool. Here's one of those little nodes. Uh, you can see it has, uh, this is just one of the, there were 40 of these in that rack, and this is just one of those. It has four terabytes of, of RAM um, and, a, and a, a many, many, many core uh, ARM64 processor on it. Um, and we, we put, you put 40 of these in a rack. Uh, we designed it to scale up to 80 in a single rack, so that's, uh, so this, uh, this uh, the system that we built is 160 terabytes. Uh, you can obviously scale up beyond that. And the way that it co connects, all these racks connect, is through this interesting new uh, memory interconnect. Uh, we did this memory interconnect as a, a prototype of a new, uh, new uh, uh, system interconnect called Gen Z. Uh, this is not Gen Z, but it's uh, a lot of the same ideas are in the, in the two systems. Um, it's designed to be a load store fabric, which means you plug all these 40 nodes together and you can execute instructions on the processor and fetch data over the, over the fabric. Uh, so unlike a network, unlike even uh, uh, you know, a Rocky enhanced ethernet where you have this DMA cap capabilities, those still require software intervention for every transaction over the fabric. With this architecture, you're literally just executing CPU instructions and it's going and fetching data over the fabric. So your latencies are very low, uh, your bandwidth is, is obviously very high, and the complexity of the software is very, very low. You don't have to do any, any complicated mediation of, of buffering data or figuring out where the data is gone now. You can just execute instructions and take advantage of the enormous amount of memory. Um, this is, a, this is <coughs> the, one of the network backplanes. You can see it has a lot of wires in it. Um, there's a combination of copper, uh, copper interconnects and optical interconnects. Obviously, we're doing a lot of work with optics to try to make sure that we can, we can reach beyond the rack scale and go to data center scale with the same kind of bandwidth and latencies. Um, you can't get there with uh, copper. It's too big, it's too slow, and it takes a lot of power. And so we're doing a bunch of work with optics. Uh, one of the chips that we made is this cool little X1 uh, optical uh, interconnect. Um, it's literally uh, silicon that has lasers 
etched onto it. So you'd be using silicon fabrication to build these little uh, little ring lasers. Um, I went to a tech talk uh, last year, an HPE internal talk about this, and it was, I was just you know blown away by what they're able to do uh, in terms of uh, improving the performance and getting a bandwidth out of the chip. So it's a it's a multi lambda. Uh, a multi ring laser uh, on a single piece of silicon that all feeds into this single optical fiber coming off of it. It's just like, you can do that. <laughs> it was, it was, it's really cool. So we take advantage of that, of course. Um, and then we go, uh, and then we try to find problems. Uh, one of the problems that HP has, HPE has these days, is that we, we run a big network and we have a lot of data coming out of our system. Um, and we have a lot of people trying to attack that network. Um, and trying to do the analytics on the, the patterns of attack that are coming in is very difficult because you have to be doing it in real time. You can't, it is, this is not a batch process. You really have to be updating your database in real time. You really have to be doing uh, analysis of the data set that's coming in. And the technique that, one of the techniques that we're using is this large scale graph inference. Uh, people use this for social network graphs. They use it for, you know, to figure out advertising. They use it for all kinds of data where what you have is a bunch of independent agents that have relationships. And you want to find out how those relationships affect what the, what the, uh, what the oper op operators are doing. Um, and so what you want to do is you want to, uh, you want to balance, uh, balance this enormous graph. It's got, well, this has got this weight and this has got this weight. And there's this enormous computation. The thing about large scale graph inference is that it's, it's, you can do local computations. But every, every iteration of that local computation changes what your locality is, which is to say through every step of the graph, you have to completely change the data that you're operating on. And in a traditional scale out architecture, that means you do a little step of your, of your inference, and then you shuffle data, data across the network, and then you do another step. The steps in this problem are very small, which means you're spending most of your time doing communication in a traditional scale out architecture. What memory driven computing gives us it's the ability to just do those, do a step and then say, oh, I need different data. Well, let me just go fetch the data. It's out in the memory pool. I don't have to do any, any, uh, any distribution and, and uh, shuffling of the data. Uh, let's see, the problem that we're working on here, we have, um, let's see, uh, got some numbers for you. Uh, three and a half billion web pages, hundreds of billions of computers. Uh, so that's, you know, the, the scale of the problem is starting to get interesting. Um, uh, the, pro the particular problem that we were working on here is actually a security analytics problem at HP, uh, analyzing a single hour of data. And a single hour of data that we have is like, um, I think it's, uh, see if I can get the, yeah, not tell lies about the numbers here. Um, let me find my other, my other piece of information here. And yes, I can't see my screen. Uh, so we have, we, have, um, we have a single hour worth of data, which is 20 billion uh, points in a data set. And what we're trying, the problem is, is if, is if you're looking at traffic analysis of a single hour, you're missing any sort of long-term uh, long uh, data. What we really need to be able to do, we think, is to be able to get it out to about a week's worth of data. And so you take an hour, multiply it into a single week, and you're getting a, a, a significantly more data. So this particular video that I'm going to show you here um, is just a single hour's worth of data. And you can see how little of uh, the memory fabric test bed we actually need to use. Let me actually go find the video here. Let's see if I can like, locate that. If I drag it here. Uh, of course, the external monitors, the, the delight of modern high resolution graphics. Let's see if I can actually make it not overfill the external monitor. Yeah, I should be able to hit this key and play. Here we go. Okay, so this is just going to show you um, our little memory, the little memory fabric test bed executing this problem with an hour's worth of video trace data. Uh, so you can see I have 40 nodes, 160 terabytes of memory, and you're going to see just how much memory is required, what percentage of the system memory is required for this problem. So there's 20 million uh, data points, there's 55 million connections, um, and I have an enormous amount of memory. And you can see here, uh, the little blue spots, those indicate the data that we actually are using for this problem. And they're scattered across the entire machine, um, and it's going to execute this fine, uh, fine, um, fine analysis problem. 
Um, the, so the algorithm is obviously computing. You can see it talking between the nodes to find, uh, find data uh, across the fabric, and it's going and collecting data from various points, and it's, it's doing a single step here. Um, it's not terribly, like I said, what do you do when you have a, a, a computer, the only thing it does is, is fetch from memory and uh, store back to memory. It doesn't do a lot of fun stuff. So you can see here the problem is actually starting to reach out and using the, the fabric to, to take advantage of the fact that it can uh, fetch data from all the way around the system and not have to do any, any complicated communication. And so you can see this is actually showing each node, each computing node, going out and touching memory from the other nodes and fetching it for the analysis step of the problem. You can see how much of the memory bandwidth of the system we're using right now. We're using 0.61%. Uh, so there's a lot of headroom available here, and this is an hour's worth of data. So we think we can competently do you know, a week's worth of data in the system without too much trouble, which is pretty cool. Um, and so that's kind of one of the problems we're looking at right now. Um, so the, the bar charts here are showing you the convergence of the problem show you how the actual solution of it, um, and it's getting better and better and better. We're converging, you know, 32%. Uh, and that's to say, as you do each iteration, the graph gets weighted and rebalanced, and you do another iteration, the weight's updated and slowly converges on a solution. And you can see it's, it's nearly converged by now, and it's done a lot of computation. And that's the excitement of demos on, on, on the system. Uh, this particular uh, graphic right here, uh, we've uh, since, uh, since updated the underlying system there this summer. Got a, a couple of interns uh, making that software more reliable. Let me show you what they've been doing. Oh, it's almost converged. It's so exciting. Yeah. We got to show this demo over and over and over again in Las Vegas a couple of months ago. So. Yeah, that's, that's the excitement of demos on the machine. By demo. So you can see we're getting a significant speed up though. We ran this problem in a scale out architecture, and the scale out architecture is literally 128 times slower. So we really have got some pretty impressive speed up. It really is all about getting rid of that communication overhead and getting to the, getting the place where you can take your computation and apply it to the data without moving your data to the computation. <clears throat> okay, now I actually want to talk about the uh, software that we built. Um, oh, I have, an, I have another one. Do I have a Monte Carlo simulation? Here's a, a Monte Carlo financial simulation. Um, so the Monte Carlo simulation, obviously one of the, one of the goals there is, is to be able to do a bunch of random analysis on your data. Uh, well, it turns out that if you pre-compute a, uh, a bunch of the data in, some of this, in this financial model, and use, uh, use uh, interpolation within your pre-computed set, you can generate results a lot faster. Uh, and in fact, if you pre-compute a lot, like 100 terabytes of data, it's about 10,000 times faster than computing it from, from, from scratch every time. Who would have thought? Um, and so the uh, availability of an enormous amount of memory, uh, just an enormous amount of memory without a, without a huge amount of computation can speed up uh, some problems dramatically. You kind of look at the problem a different way. Instead of thinking, well, instead of thinking that memory is just being, you know, a tiny memory like, you know, 10, 20 terabytes, I uh, think about it as, you know, actual reasonable scale memory of a couple hundred terabytes. Uh, and you can start really computing some stuff in advance and, uh, and, and change your ability to change, change the problem from having to operate in, in batch mode to being able to operate in real time. So we did some financial risk modeling and we were able to take it from something which used to take several hours to take just a few seconds, which is literally 10,000 times faster, just by having a machine with, enorm with an enormous amount of memory. If you had to do that in a cluster again, the problem with doing it in a cluster is you'd have to distribute the problem to the entire cluster and somehow figure out which parts of that data were relevant for that particular, for that particular request, and that would take a bunch of time to transmit that data. And in that cluster model, it's faster to compute than cache. But in a memory-driven model, it's faster to cache than to compute. Okay. I want to just get beyond this stuff and talk about what I actually came here to talk about, which is Linux for memory-driven computing. Um, Debian is all we use for memory-driven computing, uh, and uh, because what else would one use? It's the universal operating system. Obviously, it scales. It scales from my watch <laughs> all the way to the biggest computer, biggest computers in the planet. Uh, so um, all the software.
software I'm talking about right now is up on GitHub, uh, and, we're, and we're doing all the development, we're trying to do all the development in the open. It's really hard to take a corporate structure and move it from uh, uh, development in, in, in a little closed silo to saying, no, actually your commits are available on GitHub all the time. Um, so we're, we're uh, teaching people how to do that right now. The last stumbling block we have is that we have some Jenkins infrastructure, which is tied to our GitHub Enterprise instance inside the firewall, which automatically does our CI, uh, our continuous integration and testing stuff. We haven't got that replicated externally. So the developers are like, I'm not going to push it. It's not getting tested. I'm like, oh, I really hate telling people that they have to move external and they don't get testing anymore. So we're fixing that. Uh, but that's literally the only stumbling block we have at this point, is trying to get to the point where we have continuous integration and testing. Uh, outside our firewall. But most of our stuff is being done externally. Uh, this is the system we built. Uh, we have hardware, we have Linux, we have a bunch of libraries, and I'm going to talk about some of those. Uh, so we, we came to DevCon um, three years ago in Portland, four years ago, three years ago, I think it was three years ago, uh, to talk about HLinux and what we were doing with, uh, with Linux in uh, HPE. HLinux was something we were building for our Helion system. Uh, Helion was a, kind of an OpenStack uh, deployment vehicle, um, and we were using, uh, we were taking Debian and customizing it for that. Debian took, uh, it took a bunch of work to make Debian suitable for that, not because Debian wasn't ready, but because uh, he, OpenStack has specific uh, dependencies on a lot of different packages. So we actually had to take Debian and like, uh, you know, take random versions of of various Python packages from, you know, anything from really stale to really brand new to try to construct a, a horizontal stack that can support OpenStack above it. And that's what HLinux was all about. So how do we take a Debian system and make it be able to be very purpose-built for uh, supporting a specific OpenStack deployment? And we did that, uh, Helion OpenStack. Uh, Helion OpenStack recently got sold uh, from out my employer off to Microfocus and SUSE, and it's all very complicated right now. But so HLinux no longer really has a, a, a role in our organization in terms of supporting the Helion system. Um, and so what we're, doing, uh, what we're doing right now is we're transitioning that from this HLinux base, which is how we started the Linux for the machine, uh, because we had a Debian system and we needed to support another architecture, so we kind of built on top of HLinux. And we're transitioning from that purpose-built horizontal Debian distribution to just running Debian and taking a small pile of packages and adding them in. Uh, so that we have uh, a Debian unstable system, and then we just have probably 15 or 20 packages that we've built, including some new kernel modules, and new device drivers, and that kind of stuff. Uh, so it really is just Debian running uh, in most of our environments. We're not running this on the MFT yet because we need magic kernel bits and a bunch of newer stuff uh, that is not quite in Debian, even Debian unstable yet. But we're getting closer and closer. So we're taking this transition from our very purpose-built horizontal HLinux distribution you're just crunching it down and saying, okay, we're just running Debian, and then we're just going to add a few packages. I want to talk about the packages that we're adding. Uh, so we have uh, two systems that we need to run Debian on. We have our external management system, which runs management services and our uh, file system uh, metadata management. Um, and this is where all the uh, kind of interesting packaging stuff and a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about in a few minutes is about. And then on each of the nodes, each of those 40 things, the uh, green lights, uh, they run another Debian system. It's running entirely in memory. So this is not, this is kind of like an NFS root environment, but kind of not, uh, because we don't have, uh, we are actually just, we're building an init ran disk, and that's what you run. Uh, the nodes are entirely stateless that way from the perspective of the individual node. Of course, they have access to this fabric attached memory, this enormous pool of memory, which is persistent and persists beyond the life of this node. So it's kind of a weird little world that, that it lives in. So we have, to, we have these very ephemeral um, entire operating system instances. So in a lot of ways, it kind of looks like a container sort of thing, where you kind of spring this node into existence, it runs an operating system for a while, and then it gets shut down. Um, and the data that it's computed is stored in memory, in this persistent memory. Uh, and so we needed to build a way of getting these things up and running, and I think I'm hopeful that the, uh, the piece of technology will kind of inspire somebody to think, wait a minute, that's a neat hack. I wonder if I could use that for what I need to do over here. So I wanted to talk about that. We have three hardware targets that we're targeting uh, for this system. We obviously have a memory fabric test bin, uh, that giant piece of uh, hardware that I uh, showed you. Uh, we have an emulated environment that I can run on my laptop. I, I can actually build a machine on my laptop. 
Obviously, it doesn't have 160 terabytes of memory, but it does have uh, all the same architectural characteristics. Um, and I did a whole bunch of testing for uh, a program that we'll be uh, uh, showcasing uh, later this fall uh, with a German, uh, German research institute. I did a whole bunch of the prototyping of that, you know, on my laptop. It's like, okay, that's kind of cool. I can do memory develop, memory uh, driven computing development in, you know, on the airplane. So it was nice. Um, and another piece of hard that we have is this MC990X, which is this, um, which is this uh, sc uh, scale up ish computer uh, from the SGI division, um, and it's it can, it is normally uh, delivered as a pure scale up system, up to 128 processors, up to a bazillion bytes of memory. I really don't know how much memory it can hold. But it turns out that you can actually take this thing and partition it and break it up into individual little, little virtual computers uh, with a, a collection of processors and a networking interface and a bit of their own little local memory. And then they can communicate over, this, uh, over, this, um, over the fabric that, uh, that is in the hardware with other nodes in the same box. So we can build something that looks very much like memory driven computing with hardware that we're shipping today. And that means we can actually do a bunch of memory driven computing research uh, with hardware that we have available today. Uh, newer hardware coming out is going to enable, it will scale that up a little bit bigger. Um, it has some other characteristics that's interesting. But it lets us kind of do research in the software and systems uh, development that we need with hardware that we're shipping today, um, as well as this prototype hardware that we have. Uh, obviously, with the prototype hardware, the big problem is availability. There's like, you know, four of them. Uh, whereas with this MC990, you know, we can make as many as we want because it's a, it's a shipping product. So that's the three uh, targets that we have. Um, so one of the other things we lost when all of our software resources went off to Microfocus was we lost our, uh, kind of our, our system integration and development team. We no longer have anybody working with us that maintains our build system. Uh, we don't have anybody working for us that maintains our build hardware in particular. Uh, so uh, we're, we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to build kind of a virtual build environment using containers. We actually had some uh, interns over the summer build us a, con a container that you drop it on a random machine uh, running a random operating system that supports SUSE, Fedora, Red Hat, Ubuntu. You just drop it into a random, uh, a random machine and it springs up a Debian container and you, you say go and it goes and fetches all of the software that we need for our system. Uh, downloads it from Git, compiles it, and emits devs. So it's kind of a, a build in a box. It's just you dump it on a random machine and push it go. Uh, and that was done by a couple of interns this summer. That's been really useful because it means that we can just go out and find a random piece of hardware somewhere that happens to be working today and get our software built. We don't have to depend upon having the magic build server that's off in the corner and is you know, gold plated and never touched by anybody. And that's been very useful to us. Um, and then we also have another little container that we run that can actually stand up and deliver a Debian, uh, Debian packages. That's, uh, that's a container that's got a bunch of Apple hacks in it. And you just hand it a pile of devs and say go, and it, uh, it you know, serves Debian, uh, con constructs a repo and, and serves Debian bits out of that, which is kind of cool. Um, did I question? No, sorry. Okay. Uh, and then we have this, we have uh, external management services uh, that actually kind of run on this external server and we actually have another container that runs all of these as well, oddly. Uh, but we have the library, which is our metadata service that I'll talk about, our file system metadata service. Uh, we have this manifesting thing and that's the service that we built that actually constructs these init RAM disks and takes packages and builds them and customizes them for each node. And that's kind of the software that I want to spend a bunch of time talking about in a few minutes. And then we have that pretty dashboard which shows all the stuff. And then we have the usual selection of random network services. Um, let's see. So this is where all the bits live. Uh, they're out on GitHub. All the packages are there. Um, some of the, uh, I think there's probably two or three packages that aren't currently, uh, currently being kind of developed externally. Uh, we're mirroring them externally currently. But we're not actually actively developing them out there. And we're trying to, as I said, we're trying to get to the point where we can do that. Because obviously then other people can contribute. And until we do that, it makes it more difficult for other people to contribute. Um, and that's our current plan. So this is, the, this is all the stuff that we're shipping. And I'm going to go through a bunch of these and uh, tell you what they are. The ones with stars here are the ones that are actually, that's where the project lives. There's no, there's no clone in, elsewhere. Um, and we're working on making that happen for all of them. So this is the little container I talked about, the build container. Um, 
So it's just a Docker container for building, uh, for building our, all of our packages. It's just got a, 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 a script that runs through and you know, get clones, uh, and then uh, DE builds them. All the packages that, that get, get emitted are unsigned, of course, because there's no signing authority here. So it's, not, it's useful for testing. Uh, we need to figure out how to make it useful for actual deployment, how we can actually get the packages signed, um, and how to actually uh, make, you know, make it part of the, the, the continuous integration system as well. Uh, so this is, this is what we're going to be replacing our currently creaky internal Jenkins instance, which runs on a box that has no sysadmin for it right now. God, I hope it doesn't crash. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this builds all the packages that are necessary to kind of stand up a little, one of our little instances. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't build a bunch of random stuff that we don't need for testing. Uh, and it was uh, done by an intern this summer. Um, Austin worked on this. Uh, it is really cool to work at a corporation that has a very strong uh, history and policy of bringing in high school and college interns. I think we had eight or ten of them. You know, we have a group of eight engineers now, and we had like eight or ten interns working with us. It was really cool. So all of a sudden, our group doubled in size for the summer with a bunch of high school and college uh, students, which was great to see. Uh, here's the repo container um, uh, that, um, that David did. Uh, he, he, it's uh, either called DevServe, which is the name he started with, um, and then uh, some marketing guy, I guess, got at him and said, well, we have to put our corporate branding on that and called it the L4 Fame repo container. Um, and this, this is not specific to L4 Fame or, uh, uh, or our memory-driven computing stuff at all. It's literally just a container that you throw a pile of devs at and it stands up a, a Debian. Uh, Debian package repository for it. It automatically generates indices, automatically starts up an Apache instance that will serve them out. Uh, so it's kind of convenient if you, if, you just, if you just want to build a bunch of devs and don't want to have, have to go through the problem. I use, um, I use a mini D, what is it, mini, mini something. I don't even remember what it's called anymore. Uh, just to do that on my local laptop, but this looks like it's probably even easier than that because it's all automated and you, all you have to do is build the devs and hand them to it. Uh, very convenient. Uh, when you update the devs, it automatically tracks changes to those. This is, oh, look at that, dot dev change. Let me go rebuild the index. So kind of a mini deconf, I think it's called. That's the thing I was using. Uh, this uses Apply, of course, to generate all this data. And it's all nicely automated in package. Um, and the, the other, other container that the uh, couple, couple of interns did, uh, my and Madison worked on, was this, uh, our ma all of our management services are now in a container. So you can just kind of, uh, you, you know, they can pull down the devs automatically, build up a little container, and just say go, and now you have all the, all the management services. And this means that we can uh, kind of stand up test instances or infrastructure really quickly without having anything customized on your own box. Uh, so if you want to do memory-driven computing development, you can get this Torms in a box, stick that container in a machine, uh, instantiate a couple of VMs uh, that run the nodes, um, and get uh, L4 or Fabric Attached Memory Emulation running on your laptop in a matter of minutes without touching your base operating system at all. So for people who want to just come and you know, toy with it a little bit and see what it's like, uh, we're working on making it very convenient. Another thing worked on by, uh, by Lily and Annie this summer was um, our TM dashboard. And that dashboard is that, is that pretty UI you saw before. Uh, trying to generate uh, actionable intelligence about the state of the memory-driven fabric. Uh, it's really hard uh, and trying to capture what's going on and figure out where the bandwidth problems are, where the performance issues are, where your application bottlenecks are. And so we're trying to build some infrastructure. Um, and so this is, this is a little web, it's all web-based, it's a little web service that goes and touches all of the nodes and all the infrastructure and says, what's going on with you? So we have a bunch of monitoring and, and, uh, and logging hooks there and it captures all that data and presents it in a, in a pretty little, little web UI that looks like this. You saw that before. So you can see uh, we're trying to generate data that shows the user what's going on uh, in real time. And that was done by a couple of interns this summer, uh, the, the new version of that. The old version uh, from the demo was uh, done by a, a team in, in Bristol who are now looking, uh, now doing something else. So it's nice to have that kind of uh, very customized <coughs> Uh, system brought in-house. Uh, the library monitoring protocol, that's what this ma management tool uses. Uh, it goes out and, and touches all the, all the nodes and brings in data um, and, uh, and shares that out to that, to that dashboard. So the emulation uh, uh, shell script, this is kind of the first uh, stuff we released. It's literally just a shell script that takes the Debian packages that we deliver and constructs a synthetic set of uh, memory-driven computing nodes 
by using this, uh, this uh, QMU uh, KVM hack called the InterVM Shared Memory System. Right, so you, you generate, you take a pile of memory on your host machine, on the, on, the, on, the, on the host machine, and you then make that visible as a device in all of the VMs, and now all the VMs can touch this memory. But that looks a lot like uh, memory-driven computing to me. <clears throat> it looks like a lot like fabric-attached memory. So that's the environment that we use to do all of our development for all of these tools. Um, so that, the initial project we put together is, just, is some simple shell scripts that generate these nodes, and we're working on improving that to automate at the point where you can actually stand up a, a memory-driven computing uh, test infrastructure on, on, a, on a single machine. Uh, so the library is kind of the heart of our, the way that we take this fabric-attached memory and present it to applications. Uh, normally applications think about memory, you think about malloc or maybe mmap as a way of getting into memory. Um, well, mmap takes files. And uh, when, I started, when we started this project a couple years ago, the researchers came and said, well, what we really want is memory that persists across the file system reboots and chunks of memory that are resizable and have names and have access rights. So we built this really complicated new system called the, called the uh, called, what do they call it? The uh, Wholesale Memory Broker. And it had this a API that you call, you pass it a name, and you pass this little mask that had access rights. Um, and it would map that memory into your process. And I looked at that and said, hmm, you know, that looks like, like a lot of, that looks a lot like something that we have in the POSIX system called a file. They're like, no, 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 it's not a file. It's memory. And I'm like, yeah, it has storage, and it has an extent, and it has a name, and it has access rights. And it looks like a file to me. So we created a file system, and the file system is entirely in memory, but it's in persistent memory. And it's distributed across all these nodes. Um, and that's what the library does. The library manages, uh, we, we, we uh, grouped the uh, chunks of memory into a group of pages. What's well, a group of pages? It's called a book. Our books are a fixed size. They're you know, the smallest allocatable unit of memory in the MFT, uh, which is only eight gigabytes. Um, and then you can collect a bunch of those, so you have a, a substantial amount of memory um, into, into something called a shelf. And a shelf is the same thing as a file. So when you talk about shelves and files, sometimes you'll see us talking about that. A shelf is just a file. But a shelf is a specific kind of file. It's a file in fabric attached memory. Uh, so the file system is visible across all the nodes. So now we have a distributed file system. Well, what's the easiest way to write a distributed file system? Well, the easiest way to do that is to have a single central server that serves out all the data about the file system. So that's how we built our first instance, which is what the librarian is. The cool thing about the librarian is the librarian doesn't actually care about the data, because the data itself, that's all just memory mapped, right? So the librarian doesn't actually have to serve the data. It only has to serve the metadata. So it has to be able to do allocations. Well, sure. Sure, you can have book 27. I can't see book 27, but you can, you can play with it. Uh, so the librarian actually runs outside of the fabric environment on a separate machine. It doesn't even have to run within the machine itself. Um, and all it does is serve the metadata. It serves, you know, allocations and access rights. And oh, sure, you can have access to that. Um, there's hardware support in the MFT to actually prevent the nodes from accessing memory they're not supposed to. I didn't really want to go into that today. <clears throat> but that means the librarian running externally is actually literally able to control access to the fabric attached memory. Um, the way that we built this, it's, a, it's, a, it's written in Python, Python 3, of course. Uh, and the way that it hooks into the node operating system is by using queues. Uh, uh, obviously, the read and write paths are not, do, don't go through the old fuse paths. They, they go directly to the memory. And, and we also added uh, NMAP support, which fuse doesn't typically bother to do. Um, and so it's literally just a fork of the fuse code. We forked the kernel bits. We forked the library bits. We forked the Python library bits. So we created our own parallel universe of views uh, that does this librarian thing. Um, and there's, this is what the librarian file system looks like. There's, it uses the VFS layer, it uses the, the, fuse, the fuse bits to, to talk to the thing. And the awesome part is the metadata is stored in a, in, in a little SQLite database uh, because we wanted to make sure that we had, uh, uh, it was persistent and transactionable and that kind of stuff. And I am running out of time and I apologize. I spent way too much time showing you about cool memory computing, <coughs> not enough about what we're doing here. 
metadata, we have a little atomic library, we have a hello world. And the thing I wanted to spend a bit of time talking about, which I'll spend the rest of the talk now, is about this manifesting thing. So uh, what we do for manifesting is we need to generate a kernel and an init RAM disk for, our, uh, for the nodes. And that's the only data the node gets. The node does not have a real, a real uh, root file system anywhere. It runs right out of the init RAM, RAM disk. Uh, the manifesting service runs this little restful service somewhere in the network. Um, and, it, and it contains this little restful service that you talk to to generate these images. And it also talks to a TFTP server and, uh, and a, um, uh, uh, so boot P and TFTP and all those usual uh, boot system, and it also talks to a, 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 a DNS service to get the names bound up and a DHCP service to get the IP addresses allocated. Um, and there, then we have a little a CLI application that talks to this uh, service. And it stores the kernels and RAM disks uh, for a Pixie to use. And so what we do is we create this golden image that contains uh, kind of a usual Debian install, a very usual Debian init RAM disk. And then, we, and then we purposely modify that image for each node. So we unpack the golden image, go in and play with it to set the host name and to set all of its IP addresses and to give it all of its uh, TLS keys that it's going to need to be able to operate in the environment. Um, and then we just hand out that RAM disk to the nodes, it boots. And so the, RAM, uh, the, node is, uh, uh, the node is then able to operate on, in the environment and have whatever customization it needs. Oh, you can also add new packages to that. It's like, oh, this node needs to have an Apache server in it. What the heck? And so you can actually uh, put into the manifest, which is why we call it manifest, you can put into that the packages that you need and the customizations you require for that system. Um, let's see. Obviously, we don't have any local storage, so they run entirely out of RAM. So on the torms, we have the DHCP server and the TFTP server, and then it just uh, serves out the stuff to the uh, uh, over Pixie. And that's a pretty simple technique. Obviously, a usual system at that point is going to get that init RAM disk, and you, the only thing it's going to use it for is to go find its real root file system. Uh, and it's going to go NFS mount it, or it's going to go find some device, or it's going to go do whatever it wants to do. Um, but ours is really actually truly diskless. There's no, it's just running out of RAM. Uh, when the operating ins instance crashes, well, its, its state is persisted in whatever FAM operations it's done. Um, and so uh, we're able to actually run entirely out of RAM, which is pretty cool. So manifesting overview uh, uses VM to bootstrap. Obviously, we're just uh, standing on the shoulders of giants as usual. Uh, it's got this little restful service. You can send commands. You can send, oh, I need to build a manifest for this, and I want that manifest to be run on these 27 nodes. Uh, so it really quickly, uh, really lets you quickly uh, configure the entire machine uh, to run the software that you need. And then you can quickly transition the machine from one state to another by just changing which manifest each, no, uh, each of the nodes are running and get the system reconfigured very rapidly. So the goal is to be able to tra transition from one project to the next uh, by just rebooting all the nodes and having it come up with all the new software that we need. So, and that's about what I have time for today. Uh, thank you all very, very much for coming out this morning and I hope we have a great week this week. I know I'm certainly looking forward to playing with everyone here. Thank you. Hello. Hi, Keith. Brandon Robinson here. Uh, I have several questions, but uh, I may not have time for all of them. Um, uh, I'm probably digging into some of the stuff you were skipping over. I was curious about some aspects of the hardware. Um, because of this innovative new design, I mean, often in engineering, we find we shift our choke points from one place to another. So in this fabric uh, attached memory, are you finding that the memory controller or controllers are th threatened to be your design choke point in the future? Uh, it's very likely. Um, and the, the, the reason, of course, is if you have a lot of contention for data in the same location, then you're going to have a lot of people accessing. It, it, it's, it's a true fabric with, uh, with, uh, with, you know, with enough bandwidth to handle uh, anybody, anybody to anybody at, at full speed. But if everybody is, is focused on a single piece of memory, then obviously you're going to be limited by bandwidth in that single piece of memory. Yeah. The goal of the of librarian is to spread the data across the fabric so you don't have a single choke point like that. And so you get uh, fairly, fairly flat access. But obviously, uh, depending, you're gonna, now you have to design your data so that it's spread across the network, uh, spread across the fabric to avoid those kind of choke points. Obviously. Right. And then you run into replication challenges. Yep. Okay. And consistency challenges. Okay. 
I'll yield the floor for next time. Hi, Keith. I'm sure I can't be the only one to have thought about this for applications for the machine. It must be incredibly quick for doing password cracking and stuff with rainbow <laughs> tables. <laughs> you would think. <laughs> If you don't How big a table can you get? The other thing, the other problem that I've looked at is uh, chess in games. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Very similar problem. Yeah. Any, any problem where you have an enormous amount of data and you don't know what of that data you're going to need today. Yep. Thank you. Obviously, I should go into password cracking. <laughs> <laughs> what could go wrong? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, going forward, uh, following this question, uh, all. <coughs> computer science, all data structures and so on were assuming that memory is in hierarchies like hash and uh, so yep. on. So, so we have slow memory, fast memory, all the databases, for example, all the indices are are to be dealt with th that this is slow, RAM is fast. When everything fits in the RAM and it, as far as I understood, there is no penalty to access this uh, persistent memory. Uh, do you think we are on the verge of uh, of revolution, something that is databases will need to behave differently and so on. Well, we've gotten rid of a bunch of the storage hierarchy, so we've gotten rid of your, your disks and your networks, uh, but we still have a lot of caches, of yeah. course. Yeah. Uh, the machine is, uh, the MFT is not cache coherent between nodes, uh -huh. and so you have, you have explicit points where you're introducing latency and delay into the system to synchronize data across the, across the fabric. Um, and so there are there are new challenges and plenty of employment for our computer scientists going forward. So fear not. <laughs> I think that's a, the last question we had time for. I'm really sorry. Um, I'll be here all week. If you have more questions, just come and come and bug me at uh, at lunch or whatever. Uh, really great to see all of you, and uh, thanks for coming again.